Welcome back to another Sound Truth interview. I'm your host, Adam Miller. And today I'm joined once again by Nancy Guthrie, who's become a regular right now here, at least this year on the uh, broadcast, as she has written many great books that I have always been blessed and encouraged by, but something I had no clue until this year is that she's actually one of the co-hosts of a ministry called Grief Share. And with the holidays here, we really want to address this issue because um, I, I have to admit, I've been unaware of how much of a pressing issue this has been for many of our listeners, but I hear about it every year. So Nancy, thank you so much for agreeing to do this conversation with us and talk about the ministry of Grief Share, and of course, be a part of many voices for that one message. Oh, well, I'm privileged to get to do so. Thank you for having me, Adam. Why don't you get it started by telling us a little bit about Grief Share as a ministry? Um, that It's hidden there, right there in the name, but for any of our listeners who have never heard about it before, what is Grief Share and what's its intended purpose? Hmm. Grief Share is held in at least 12,000 churches around the country. Uh, I imagine some of your listeners will recognize they've driven by a church and they've seen a sign outside uh, or on the church's sign that says grief share meets here Mm -hmm. Um, or maybe they'll see divorce care meets here and those two ministries are connected so what grief share is it's a 13 week small group ministry hosted at churches for people who are grieving and what happens when they go is uh, they're in a circle with other people who are also grieving, which honestly can be really helpful. Um, sometimes we wear out our friends we're in the, we're in the midst of grief and they don't want to talk about it anymore. And so it's really helpful to have this place to go where you've got permission to be sad and permission to talk about the person you love who died. So that's one aspect of a grief share meeting. You're in a circle with other people who are also grieving a loss and are looking for a place to be able to talk about it. And then at a grief share meeting, people will watch a video. I think it's probably about a 30 minute video. And um, if they go every week, they'll see my face and my husband's face. My husband, David, and I are the hosts of these 13 videos that are used at a grief share meeting. And we just serve kind of to introduce and to connect the content of those videos. So on the content of the videos are ordinary people who are telling their story, talking about their struggles or about things they've learned in the midst of grief, as well as what we'd call experts, you know, counselors, people like Paul Tripp, um, other people who have expertise, biblical wisdom to offer to grieving people. And each of the 13 episodes will focus on some different aspect of grief. You know, maybe it's about how grief makes it really hard for you to concentrate, or maybe it's dealing with the difficult things people say to you in the midst of grief that are hard for you to deal with, or maybe it's dealing with the questions of why, why has this happened? And maybe even a disruption in your relationship with God because of your disappointment in this loss that he's allowed into your life. Um, grief share also provides a workbook for you to spend some time every day, thinking through working through some of the difficult things of grief. So it's, it's actually It's the most beautiful ministry, Adam. I have people all the time, David and I will be somewhere and they'll recognize our faces from these videos and they come up to us and what they say is, grief share saved my life, Mm -hmm. (laughs) which is such an amazing thing to be a very small part of. And we really are a small part of it. I think because we're the faces of it, people think that we are, that we created it. Uh, And it's really created by a ministry based in Wake Forest, North Carolina called uh, Church Initiative. But I have to tell you, it's a ministry that we are incredibly honored to be a part of. Mm. And uh, I I hope you will forgive me because your association with this comes from a very personal place. And uh, I know that uh, your association was as the host and your husband and the co-host, but this is something that you yourself have kind of uh, been through and experienced. You hold some workshops on this very subject. Uh, this mm-hmm. is something that actually hits home for you. Yeah, my husband David and I, we have a son who's 31. And we also had a daughter named Hope and a son named Gabriel, who each just lived a short time. 
And so that's why they asked us to be the hosts. Uh, they had done a grief share series before then, but the hosts hadn't actually experienced the loss themselves, that kind of loss themselves. And so that's when we started hosting it a lot of years ago now. Um, but uh, yeah, so our experience of the death of two of our children and the questions we had and dealing with people and dealing with the hall, entering into the holidays with that kind of loss and just finding uh, our own need for a place and people to process it with. That's why um, Church Initiative asked us to host these videos. And so on the videos, we we speak a lot from our own experience, and which is a joy to get to do, and which I think helps people. I, I, I think anyone who's grieving, um, they're just looking for people who get it. And I, I just, I just remember right after the losses of our son and daughter, there was a sense in which I didn't want to read any book, I didn't want anybody giving me any advice unless they did experienced it. I felt like these are the people I can trust. And so it's a great privilege of us to hopefully provide some of that sense um, through these grief share groups that when people go and we show up on the screen and then, then they meet so many other people on the screen who um, have experienced loss. And I think so often what grief share people feel is, okay, I'm not crazy. Um, other people have had this same struggle, this same question this same difficulty in working through grief and that's a huge benefit of participating in grief share mm. i think the past two years have certainly set the table to make this a serious objective for the church because mm -hmm. uh, grief has been a a feeling that everyone has probably experienced at some point in some way shape or form um, this is really even in my own life come to the surface as i've seen people close to me dealing with grief. And this is a very timely moment for us to be talking about it, isn't it? Oh, I definitely think, think so. And, and I think more than ever, because if you think about it, so many people have lost loved ones over the last two years that they weren't even to have able to have a funeral. Yeah. Or if they did, it was just with family. They've, they've never been able to, um, interact with people about the loss, or now that they are interacting with people, it's been so long since that happened. Nobody ever mentions that person's name or their loss. It maybe just seems like ancient history to them. They think, okay, this person, surely they're getting over it because, you know, it happened a year ago or whatever. But, but, you know, yeah, but for someone who is grieving, you know, part of the process of working through the grief is interacting with people about it and being able to talk about that person you love who died. And so I just think there just have to be so many people out there who they had this loss, but they've just never been able to work through it in community. And so it's a great thing that Grief Share has offered a lot of online groups during um, COVID and when people have been maybe more hesitant to go out, but also groups are beginning to meet online. So it's a beautiful thing, the way it works, Adam. Like if, you, if, if somebody's listening and they think, wow, I wonder if there's a group that meets somewhere near me, all they have to do is go to griefshare.org online and input their zip code and then the, what's going to come up for them is groups that meet within five miles of them, 10 miles of them, 25 miles of them. It'll say who the, the leader, who the facilitator is, and maybe an email or phone number for them, when and where they meet, if they're meeting in person or meeting online. So it's such a great way for people to be able to check out groups that may be meeting in their area and know exactly. Okay. So they, I, this is a good time of year too, because I bet a lot of them, maybe they're just wrapping up um, meetings for the fall, but it's going to say, we're going to have a new group that's going to start meeting, you know, January 15th through April, whatever, you know, and so they can look at all of those and find out where are groups meeting that I can connect with. I think it's also really important to note the fact that there were a lot of community groups that were meeting maybe for support for grief uh, communities and support groups that had stopped meeting and and uh, the church maybe outside of the church these meetings were taking place 
but this is really a chance for the church to really rise up and uh, to be a city that's on a hill because where there were a lot of organizations that were already doing this, uh, those might have dropped away. This is the time for the church to fill in that place where they were always meant to be, right? As a part of Absolutely. The group for the community. You know, so every once in a while, Adam, I'll meet a pastor who seems for some reason, I can't completely identify hesitant to offer grief share at their church. Maybe it's some sense of loss of control of what's being said. Mm-hmm. And there, there, are, there are a couple of things that I always tell them. Number one, if you have a grief share that meets on your campus, what you're going to discover is that the grief share ministry brings more unchurched people onto your property than any other ministry you ever do. I think that's because, you know, here, here are grief, there, people are grieving. They begin to search online for grief counseling, grief help, and up pops grief share. And they put in their zip code and they find out, okay, there's a group that's meeting there. There's no cost to it. And I can show up and go. And so, um, so for example, when uh, our former church had a grief share group that David and I would go participate in kind of every 13 weeks, we would go in person to that group. And it was always the case, Adam, that more than 50 of the people who, 50% of the people who are participating did not go to our church. And most of them were unchurched. So this is, so I, I tell pastors, number one, you need to know it's going to bring more unchurched people onto your property than any other ministry that you'll ever do. But then secondly, what you can count on in the grief share videos is that with every episode, the gospel is presented. Mm with in every episode, and and I can say this because I have voiced some of these things myself in these videos, to be able to say, you think your greatest problem is your grief. And I know it's really heavy right now, but what you must understand is your greatest need is to become joined to Christ by faith. And that when you do that, the Holy Spirit um, begins to dwell in you. And the Holy Spirit, who is the comforter, the one who speaks truth into all of our crazy thoughts we have in the midst of grief. So there are great reasons to offer grief share at your church. It brings unchurched people there. And when they're there, they're not only helped with their grief, they're introduced to Jesus Christ. That's a very important point and and something that I have to confess because the grief share was not even on my radar for a while because Uh, It just didn't pop up in all of my immediate concerns. But when it did start to pop up, I started to realize how many people out there were in need of this support and and people from the community. Um, For someone who's wondering, is this something that they can even start in their church? What kind of advice do you have for them of considering how to approach it? Well, they grief share the organization church initiative. They don't just like sell the curriculum and then you're on your own like so many kinds of video curriculum, which is not bad for many things, but for this it is because what Church Initiative does is they provide training and support for grief share leaders. You know, even this ongoing, having it online for people to be able to find you, you know, you submit your information and you tell them. So, but, so all you have to do, go, if you think me, man, maybe our church should do this. We've got a few people in our church who are grieving. And I know some other people in the community who might join us. So go to griefshare.org and you'll be able to click, you know, I'm interested in, in perhaps becoming a host. And you'll talk to one of the people on their staff who are so knowledgeable and helpful uh, to, to, to help you figure out, they'll, they'll provide training for you as a facilitator, as much training as you want. They'll help you with, you know, ordering workbooks for people and, and getting the, you know, the content on DVD or however you want to have it delivered to you. And so they make it really easy and provide lots of support. So I really encourage churches to think about begin offering this. Mm. The way it kind of came onto my radar is I had three people ask me if our church was hosting a grief support group. And, and the three people in the same weekend asked me that question. Wow. I said, well, maybe that's a, a sign I should kind of look around. And then I find that the, one of the uh, ladies that works here in her office is an assistant. Uh, she's running a grief share at a different church. And mm. so I started asking her and I started looking around in my church. I said, well, I, I need to have somebody in my church that can facilitate, facilitate it. it. And uh, I, I, I started asking around. I found somebody who had just lost uh, their mother 
And she had already been trained actually in uh, the program. So wow. the, the irony of how all these things kind of came together. And of course, I was talking to you earlier this year and mm -hmm. found out that uh, you were the co-host of it. And it just seemed all these things providentially were coming together. Mm -hmm. But when you start to listen to what's happening out there, when you start to hear the stories, it seems pretty clear and evident that the church needs to be a place that can be a meeting grounds, a place, a city on a hill for those who are going through these issues. And if we're not proactively looking for them, they're probably suffering in silence. Mm. Uh, yeah, there's a, I just, oh, I can hardly think about it, Adam. So many people who have had to grieve in such silence and solemnity uh, because of COVID. But you also have to recognize even during normal times, people tend to withdraw in the midst of grief, you know, I think some of that's, there's something just socially awkward about grief. Um, it's really hard to walk into places, you know, I mean, just put yourself in someone's shoes, you know, let's say a widow who's lost her husband, you know, she goes to church and she's walking in by herself. And the Sunday school class, she also used to always sit with her husband and she doesn't feel like she fits in anymore. And she's anticipating all of these interactions in the foyer of the church before and after. And everybody's going to say, how are you? And they mean well, and they really care, but it's hard to answer that question over and over again. And then as she sits in the service, you know, both the preaching, but especially the music will perhaps bring tears. And that's kind of awkward because everybody thinks if you cry, you're crying, they think, oh, she's not very doing, she must not be doing very well because she was crying, not realizing that actually tears make complete sense in the midst of loss and that tears are, are something God uses to actually uh, bring healing to us in the midst of loss, that it's appropriate to weep over loss, that sadness doesn't reflect the a lack of faith and sadness doesn't mean you're not doing this right or not doing this well or that you're not doing well you know so there's there's just all of that <laughs> um means that maybe you just stay home especially now that so many churches are are live streaming right yeah. and so that you can avoid some of that awkwardness and um so it's a huge hurdle for people to walk into a grief share room so I guess, let me speak for a moment to, not to those who are grieving, but those who know someone who is grieving, that maybe one of the best things you can do is say, you know what, um, I think Grief Share will really help you. I'm going to do some investigation about the groups. So I'll, even, I'll even talk to some of the facilitators and get a sense of the makeup of their group that's meeting. So you'll have a sense, are there other widows there? Are there other people who've lost a child there who are, are coming and just get a sense of the facilitator. And then, you know what, I'll come and pick you up and I'll drive you and I'll wait for you. And I'll be there just to help someone over the hurdles of participating. I mean, think about how many people you say to someone when they've lost someone, boy, whatever I could do to help, I'm there, right? Uh, you just, you call me, I'll help you. Well, Maybe here's something you could do. Let's put that offer of help to the test. And something that will really help them in the midst of grief might be your encouragement and support to get them to grief share where they can get some of the help they really need. Mm. You know, one of the areas that I have to admit I've, I've overlooked the need in the ministry of grief share is during this holiday season. Mm. And right now we're actually talking about joy on our, our broadcast as our theme, you know, for Advent. And we're talking about joy. And for a lot of people, that is a sore subject. I have to admit, I've often overlooked it. And yet every season I hear from people who are really hurt during this season. And I never knew really how to help them, how to take care of them. But Grief Share has a, a one day program called um, Surviving the Holidays. I think that's absolutely amazing. Uh, tell us a little bit about that and why it's so important during this season. Yeah, well, we'll think about it. Like, so we've just gotten through Thanksgiving, right? And we're heading into Christmas. Think about the way we greet each other, you know, happy Thanksgiving, Merry Christmas, yeah. happy new year. And you say that to someone's grieving and they just think, how can I be happy? And why would you expect me to be merry? Uh, don't you understand that as I face New Year's, I'm entering into a year 
that I'm not going to share. I'm, I'm leaving the year where this person I loved was here with me. And I'm entering into a year that that person will never experience with me. And so that's where a grieving person's head is, right? When, when we come along and, you know, we're just wanting to, we're wanting to help cheer them up, right? And uh, for a grieving person, that can just be, you know, just outright annoying. Uh, but a grieving person also just does need perhaps a little encouragement to think differently about the holiday, to approach some things about the holidays in some ways that might be helpful. So for example, I, I went to, um, I went to, uh, the women of my church met a couple of nights ago for, uh, our holiday get together. And there's a woman at my church whose son, uh, was murdered about a year ago. And so I stood and talked with her and she was talking, our, our conversation centered around being with family at the holidays, because what often happens, sometimes families, that's the place where we expect that we are going to be able to talk about the person who died. And yet oftentimes families are the worst. Like you, you so for her experience, you know, she gets to Thanksgiving dinner with all the family and nobody brings up the fact that her son isn't there. And I was talking to her about that. I was like, it, because they don't say anything doesn't necessarily mean they aren't thinking about it and that they aren't sad with you. They don't know how to bring it up and they don't know if you want them to bring it up. And, and once it comes up, they're thinking, oh, well, you know, then everybody cries and then it's not a good holiday. And so I told her, I said, you know, I wonder if you might think about for Christmas to actually send everybody a little letter or email ahead of time that lets them know, you know what? I really want to talk about Robert and I want you to bring up his name. In fact, could we have a time during the meal when we all talk about memories of Robert at previous Christmases? And I said, what you're doing in that is you're actually kind of preparing your family to succeed in this rather than ignoring it. And then they're kind of set up to fail, um, which I think is easy for us to do with our families in all kinds of ways, but especially in regard to grief. And so she started thinking that through and I was like, you know, the more specific you can be, I want so-and-so to initiate it when we're there, you know, it's so just to, to set it up to succeed. So that might just be one thing that's the kinds of things you might hear at this surviving the holidays, but there'll be other tools uh, to get that will be presented there for grieving people to, not necessarily it's going to take all of the sorrow away from the holidays, but that it would be a time you could actually move forward through this grief in a way toward healing um, so that the holidays wouldn't have to be something that you just dread and want to go hide under the covers and not experience at all, but that actually some of the joy of the incarnation of Jesus coming into this world and what that means, the hope that that actually means for those of us who are in the midst of grief could become a reality that soothes your grief and encourages your heart. Hmm. One of the things that I've observed in this is that we often have moved on when we've been to a funeral for a friend or a loved one uh, back a year ago, you know, we've moved on. But for many of the people that are dealing with this grief personally, this is their first holiday season they're going through without that loved one. And exactly, we, we easily forget that this is really difficult for them. And it's sometimes it's even more than a year, it's several years uh, that they are going through that issue. So it's hard for us, I think, to take note of that. So this is kind of a call for our listeners to take an inventory of their friends and their family and the people that are close to them in their church and be considerate of the fact that many of them might actually be suffering, even though they put on a, a, a strong face, they might actually be going through a great heartache during this season. That is such a good word, Adam. And in fact, I would, I would encourage your listeners, if you know someone who's lost someone in this last year or two, just take a moment it doesn't have to be some, you don't have to go buy a card or have some grand gesture. What grieving people want most is for their grief to be acknowledged and esteemed. Mm. And so 
maybe you just send a text. You just say, you know what? We're putting up our tree today. And I'm thinking about you and what it must be like for you to put, think about a tree and putting ornaments on your tree and all of the memories and then use that person's name. You know, all the memories of Robert that must come along with your Christmas traditions. And I just want you to know that I'm thinking about you and that I'm sad with you. I know there's a huge empty place where he is not around your table and in your life in these holidays. And oh my, let me tell you what, you do that for a friend and you are a friend for life for that person. Um, I have, a so when, when we had our daughter, Hope, um, we had her at Christmas. We had our son, Gabe, at Christmas. And after Hope died, I made 500 Christmas ornaments with Hope's picture. It, it's, doesn't, it, sounds, it doesn't sound good, but trust me, it's pretty sweet. It's a picture of Hope. She's, she's in a stocking. <laughs> her body's in a stocking. She's peeping out of this stocking. The stocking says Hope. So I made that for Hope. And then I had this beautiful one that I made after Gabe died of Gabe in front of a fire. I made fewer of those, but I gave those to a few people. But, you know, just yesterday in the morning, morning, you know, I wake up to a text from one of my friends. And <laughs> it's a picture of her, her Christmas tree on which she's put this uh, ornament of Hope and this ornament of Gabe. And she does that every year she just one day sends me a little text of that picture and it's a beautiful thing for this mom's heart you know I don't forget them but to know that other people don't forget them too and throughout the season because I made so many of those I, I'll I'll have many people over the next few weeks he'll just you know either they'll send me a text or I'll see them in person they'll say I put I put hopes ornament on my tree you know because they still put it on their tree and grieving people they just have a huge desire to to know that they are not forgotten and that the person they love who has died is not forgotten by other people so it's a huge gift to just let them know that you're thinking about them specifically during this holiday season recognizing that there's a unique pain in the midst of the holidays because of that loss mm. that's so important and for someone who hasn't experienced it as you have uh, I don't know what the appropriate way to approach somebody is. Maybe I'm causing more pain. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm heaping on uh, more uh, guilt or disappointment. But uh, this is actually very, uh, very helpful and very encouraging uh, for yeah. me. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to approach, approach someone you know who's had a loss. And see, here's one reason we do it, because we're afraid we'll say the wrong thing uh, and make it worse, like you said. And um the thing is, it's not so much about what you say. It's about asking a good question and just letting them know that you remember. So you don't have to say this big, brilliant thing that makes it okay. That would actually minimize their loss if you could say something that made it okay. So don't worry about that. Don't worry about making them cry. Because a lot of times we think, you know what? She's smiling today. I think I don't want to bring it up because I'll just make her sad. She's already sad. Mm -hmm. He's already sad. It, it's like a computer program running in the background all the time. And so maybe you, you mention the person they love who has died and it brings tears. Doesn't mean you ruined their day. Doesn't mean you make them sad. Think of it as you gave them the opportunity to release some of the tears that have been building up inside that maybe because nobody else has been courageous enough to mention, they haven't come out. Um, but it, it, it's a great gift to hear the person's name you love who has died. And so don't be afraid to bring it up and to say their name and don't run away or get awkward if they cry. Let them know that you're comfortable with their tears, that their tears don't make you think something's wrong, but instead their tears reveal their great love for the person who's died. And and, and, and their sense of loss that that person isn't here. I'm just realizing in all of this, how much training I need. And uh, uh, we, we need some workshops for the people who haven't mm -hmm. suffered grief because we have mm -hmm. no clue. How well, I wrote a book for this, you know. Yeah. So tell me about it. <laughs> it's called What Grieving People Wish You Knew yeah. About What Really Helps and What Really Hurts. And um, so I, I hope that's a helpful resource to, to a lot of people to not be so afraid of, doing and saying the wrong thing with grieving people.
Mm. Well, as a pastor, I'm going to get a copy of that book and I, I'm sure I'm going to recommend it to others. But I want to talk uh, now about those who are listening that are on the fence. Uh, they are, we've been talking about a support group or even surviving the holidays for people to get together. And they say, well, it's really not for me. I, my grief, you know, I, I've dealt with it already. Um, what would you say to, to our listeners who are kind of on the fence on whether or not to get involved in something like this? Yeah. Well, I'd say if you do feel like you've dealt with it and come through it well, well, wow, why don't you go and come along with some alongside someone who's there, who's really looking for someone in the flesh who's been there and maybe is a little bit further ahead than them on the road, but really needs a friend to walk through and, and, and needs someone who says, you know what, I'm headed toward healing. I've experienced some, some healing. I'll walk with you. So think about that. And if you're a grieving person and, and you think, you know what, this is just not for me. I don't want to go out. Um, I don't want to be around all those sad people. Uh, I don't want to be around people who are trying to get me to talk about stuff that I don't want to talk about. And, and honestly, to talk about the hardest thing in my life with strangers. All I can say to you is that every person I've ever known who has struggled with whether or not to go to grief share and put it off. They tell me all the time, grief share saved my life. They say, these people are now some of my closest friends. They say, now I've done grief share two or three times because I keep hearing new things that I didn't think I needed to hear, but I realized I did. And I just wasn't in the place to hear them quite yet. So my encouragement is go. And, and here's my other thing. If you go to a grief share meeting, let's say you don't really gel with a facilitator. We'll try another one because mm -hmm. there's so probably many who meet in your area. Or if you go and you think the makeup of the group, there's something about it that is uncomfortable to you. Try another one. Um, or if you go and it seems like it's just too hard now. Okay. Well, maybe catch it on the next cycle. Maybe the next 13 weeks, you'll want to give it a try. Uh, grief is not generally something that we can just withdraw from the world and recover on our own, just like a, like a physical injury. Like if you, if you get a paper cut tomorrow, Adam, you're probably not going to need a lot of therapy and help for that. You're not going to have to seek some professional medical attention, but if your arm gets cut off, you're going to need some skilled care and you're going to need some time and you're going to need some treatment. You're going to need to apply some different um, methods and uh, approaches to bring healing to that. And you know what in the grief is like an amputation. Mm -hmm. It's like you lose a whole big part of you. It's you, when you lose someone you love, it's one of the hardest things you'll ever go through in your whole life. And it makes sense. You might need some help with, for that. And you might need to apply yourself to some time for some treatment for that. And so maybe that's one-on-one -on -one counseling, or maybe it's this getting together with a group of other people who are grieving and listening to them get, which helps you get perspective on your own grief and talking about the person you love who's died and getting some wisdom from these videos that are presented, working through that workbook to think through some things and issues. And maybe you'll discover that uh, this was the healing and treatment that you really did need, even though it was really awkward to walk in the door the first time. Mm. I think that awkwardness is uh, something we all experience, but uh, not everyone that comes has to share and not everyone has to, right. you know, do all of the talk and you can go and listen and can kind of watch from the shadows. One of the objections that I heard from someone was, oh, I'm fine. You know, he dropped Jesus, right? Jesus and I are good. We're, we're all good in this context. And I had to remind him that uh, denial is one of the stages of grief. <laughs> and uh, he actually decided he's going to come. Um, oh, that's great. That's there, great. There's so many re excuses that we can make, but to really just to even just come once or to go to a surviving the holidays to experience it in that context, uh, to give it a chance to see what, uh, what they may not even realize they're dealing with personally. Yeah, that's great. Now, in the context of uh, helping people who are really struggling through this, uh, what advice do you have for people on how to invite them to something like this, how to invite mm. them and encourage them to come to a grief share or surviving the holidays? 
Um, how can we extend that invitation to those in our area? Yeah, I think um, offer to go with them is, is the big thing, you know, and I'll pick you up and I'll, I'll stay right next to you the whole time um, is a great way to do it. To maybe ask, maybe the first time just broach the topic and send them a little information about it and then say, I'm going to come back around and go, although it's getting so late, probably a lot of these are happening pretty quickly, right? Um, but I, I, I think also just there's nothing like, I'll go with you mm. and not like, here's something you really need, uh, but here's something like, here's something that might help. And I'll go with you. I, I think it's the great, the best way to um, invite someone. You know, online they could probably go to griefshare.org, get a taste of what some of the things are to maybe get a little bit more comfortable with it. But uh, just offering to be there yourself I, with them, I think is the best way. I think as well, you need people who have already been through the grief process, who have found um, uh, comfort and strength in that. To be there as support. This is not just for those who are in the, the lowest moment. There's also people that have kind of uh, been able to climb out of those dark times. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, because a lot of times it's the holidays that bring it back mm -hmm. so strongly. And they think, okay, I think I've dealt with this. And, and probably they have. They probably experienced a measure of healing. But there is something about the family time, the traditions the memories that are so significant of holiday times that can just bring it back, that it can be really helpful to just dip our toe back in and be reminded of some truths and some tools that help um, the holiday time to not be so devastating for so many of us. Mm. Knowing the, the weight of grief that many people are experiencing during this season, could I ask you to pray for them? Uh, pray for them that are suffering, but also for all of us who are uh, know somebody who's suffering grief, to be aware of it and know how to share that word in a timely season to encourage them mm -hmm. with the love of Christ. Yeah, let me do that. Lord, I bring before you uh, so many people in my own world. I mean, some of their faces I'm seeing right now who have stood at a grave over this past year and said goodbye. And I know there are so many people um, beyond those that I know. And I know there are some who are listening right now that that has been their experience. And so, Lord, we come before you as hurting people. And we are so grateful to know that you entered into this world of sorrow. I think about your words in the Garden of Gethsemane, where you said, I am overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. You understand deep grief. I think about your being uh, uh, with Mary and Martha after they had put Lazarus in the grave. And that as they came to you and you stood at his grave, that you wept. So we come to you so grateful to know that you understand deep sorrow. And I just pray, Lord, for those who are listening that you would meet them in this hard place that rather than drawing away from you, thinking that you should have done things differently and that you're a God up in heaven who's so far away from this, I pray, Lord, that as they see what it was like for you to uh, take on flesh and experience the sorrow and suffering of this world, that you're actually a very safe person to draw close to in the midst of grief. And I pray, Lord, that you would use this program, this surviving the holidays in the lives of grieving people. Would you give them the courage to step out the door and get in the car and drive to that place and walk in the door and find a seat and interact? And I pray, Lord, that as you do, that you would meet them in that, that they would gain wisdom for this journey of grief that they would gain companionship with others who understand and that you would use it to draw them closer to yourself in such a way that you would work in them through your word, by your spirit, to give them the insight, the perspective, the scriptural truth, and the Holy Spirit comfort they need to uh, work their way through the holidays in a way that they don't just hide from all the sorrow, but since that you are at work in them in the midst of the sorrow. 
your name I pray. Amen. Amen. We've been talking with Nancy Guthrie, who with her husband is the co-host of this great program, Grief Share, as well as this a great opportunity for surviving the holidays, a, a, a one-time event that can be hosted in your church to bring people in from the community and share the gospel and the love of Christ with them. If you'd like to find out more information about Grief Share and surviving the holidays, please give our office a call. It's 508-362-7070. And Nancy, it's always a joy to talk to you and encouragement. And I learned, I think, so much from just listening to you and, and giving me wisdom. It's going to help me even in pastoring my local church. So thank you so much for joining us, being a part of the many voices for that one message and being so open and transparent with your own thank story. You. Thank you, Adam. So grateful to be with you and your listeners today.